you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Can you hear me okay? No, I got to turn this on, right? Okay, there. All right, now you can hear me okay. Um, as Katie said, I am the Deputy Field Supervisor at the Twin Cities Ecological Services Field Office, and the office that I work for has the lead for preparing the listing uh, proposal for the northern long-eared bat and doing the analysis and so forth to help come to the final determination. So I'm here to talk to you a little bit about that listing process, where we've been, uh, where we're going, and the timeline and so forth. A little bit about bat biology, although I understand that you've heard quite a bit about it already today, and you've probably, you know, come to this to this forum knowing quite a bit just from doing your reading and research and so forth. A little bit more about white nose syndrome, what we're doing in terms of making that final decision, and then hopefully having a little bit more discussion about research needs, conservation, et cetera, for the bat. So, where did it all start? <laughs> um, it started in 2010, in January of 2010, when we received a petition to list the northern long-eared bat along with other species like the eastern small-footed. So that set the Endangered Species Act um, regulatory process into motion. And in October of 2013, we proposed listing the northern long-eared bat as endangered under the Endangered Species Act. There was a required 60-day public comment period, which we extended to 90 days. And during that comment period, we received nearly 40,000 public comments on the proposal. Our listing decision would have been due on October 2nd, 2014, but we did extend that deadline by six months. We reopened the public comment period along with that, and we received another 60,000 public comments during that period in August. And the extension allows us to look at newer data that maybe we've been received as part of that public comment process and in working with state partners and others to gather a, as much information as we can to inform the decision. So right now we're in that analytical phase and trying to crunch numbers and consolidate information and we would expect to finalize the decision April 2nd of 2015. So, we can talk a little bit more about the bat. I know you've heard some of this already today. It is a medium-sized bat, five to eight grams, and it's characterized by the long ears, thus the name, obviously. Uh, they're tiny little mammals that forage in a variety of forest types, and they're found roosting in many types of tree species, as far as we know. During the summer months, um, it's found predominantly in the upland forested areas. Uh, they forage at night, roost um, in tree crevices and uh, under bark during the day. And they roost alone or in small colonies under that bark or in the crevices and cracks in the trees. They seem very opportunistic in selecting their roosts. They use a variety of tree species. That's a little bit of a challenge when you're thinking in management terms. Um, as long as there's cavities or the crevices or loose bark, it seems that they can choose those trees. And during the early part of the summer, the females give birth to one pup, typically, and the pup stays in the trees all of the time for the first few weeks of its life. Um, then they'll learn to fly. They join the females as they forage and so forth. And I think you've already discussed this this morning, but they appear to move between trees during those first weeks of life. Um, within a certain uh, radius, they'll, they'll shift around. Apparently, the female will take that pup if it's small enough for her to carry, and she'll move to another tree. So it's not quite as specific as Indiana bats, which we have a lot more experience with. It's not quite as specific in staying in one particular maternity roost tree. Also, from one year to the next, the females seem to be um, going back to the same general area to roost for their maternity season. And then at the end of the summer, they migrate back to caves and mines. We thought that the typical migration was maybe 45 to 50 miles, but I think that's in question at this point. We're kind of wondering if they're also in abandoned wells or 
buildings over winter and so forth because of some of the data that show bats to be found several hundred miles away from caves or suitable um, you know, mines and so forth. Anyway, um, many of the bat species are experience, experiencing population declines, as you know. It's not just a problem for the northern long-eared, um, but they're important to the environment. They're important as um, insect eaters. They're important in terms of agriculture and saving money on you know, pest management and so forth. They're important for science because they have led to discovery of a number of things in uh, the medical arena, like immune system information or how blood coagulates. As you know, they are very widespread. This is a slide that shows you the approximate range of the northern long-eared. The hashed area within that red boundary represents its entire range as we know it. It's pretty large for a species that is proposed for listing, but it's not unprecedented to propose listing an entity that has this broad of a range. Um, there's challenges with that, but there's also opportunities because there are a number of partners we can work with, the 38 states, you know, the different forestry partners, et cetera, across the entire range. I also would like to draw your attention to that green shaded area within this map. That shows uh, forested lands. You know, they, they winter in caves, but they use those forested areas during the summer and fall, as we've talked about. And forest-related impacts aren't the primary threat to the species, but some forest practices could incidentally kill bats, from what we know, particularly those real young flightless bats. Obviously, everybody is working to better understand that. You've heard a lot of that discussion today. The other side of the coin is that forest management um, maintains healthy forests. And if we had looked at this map 100 years ago, we wouldn't have seen this much green. So the Fish and Wildlife Service recognizes that sustainable forest practices are good for the landscape. We all need to just understand a little bit more about how the specific uh, practices are affecting the species so we can figure out ways to minimize or um, avoid inadvertently harming them. So white nose syndrome. Again, you've talked about that a lot today already. It is the primary reason that the Fish and Wildlife Service is proposing to list this bat. It's a devastating fungal disease. You can see on this picture here that it grows on the face or the forearms of the bat. It causes them to have weird behaviors. They awaken during their hibernation period. They come out and fly during the day. They are looking for insects at times of the year when there aren't gonna be any out there because it's still covered with snow. Um, bat reserves become depleted and they die. Uh, the impact in the Northeast has been very dramatic. Uh, in some caves in the Northeast US, we've lost 99% of northern long-eared bats. We believe it's directly attributable to white-nose syndrome. Summer surveys also uh, reflect those declines in the bat populations, and there are other threats, to, such as mortality when maternity trees are, are cut, deaths due to wind turbines, et cetera, but we wouldn't be proposing to list if it weren't for white-nose syndrome. So while we're most concerned about white nose, we're working really hard to solve that. Um, in the meantime, there are other opportunities to address threats to the species. And as you've asked today, uh, if white nose is the problem, why are we worried about those other threats? And the simple answer is that you know, if it's listed, we'd look for any and all opportunities to improve its condition range-wide. Um, the Endangered Species Act gives us tools to address all stressors or threats to a species, good conservation practice, directs us to explore all kinds of opportunities to preserve the species. Um, the bald eagle is a good analogy for this. I know that you are well aware that 30 or 40, 50 years ago it was threatened primarily by the use of DDT in the environment. And 
while the, the Fish and Wildlife Service worked to eliminate the use of DDT in the environment in the 60s, 70s, etc., we still protected individual nests, we still worked on protecting individual bald eagles and other ways that we could restore that population. And it was a good success story. It was a holistic approach. We did have the ability as a culture, as you know, practitioners and conservationists, we had the ability to eliminate its primary threat by not using DDT. But um, we did focus on conservation across the whole environment, the whole uh, life history of the species. And we brought it back from the brink of extinction, so that's good. Yes, we hope to find ways to halt the spread of white nose, and we are thinking about it. White nose is a relatively new phenomenon. It was first discovered actually in 2006, but it wasn't until 2007 that they determined what the cause of the death of uh, bats was. It was in Schoharie County in New York, and 2007 isn't that long ago. We have seen an advance of white nose across, you know, westward and southward. And as you can see from this slide, this is where it has gotten to as of August 2014. The red and dark gray areas on the slide show counties where white nose is confirmed. The yellow and light gray show where it is suspected. And this is from the winter habitat. Now when the bats leave their winter habitat in, those in the counties that are indicated on this map, they migrate to nearby counties you know, within their maybe 50 mile migration range. Um, so even this is probably not really expressing the extent of the effect of white nose on the landscape because of that summer, you know, bringing it and sharing it and being, you know, susceptible to it and so forth. It's confirmed in like 25 of the 38 states within the Northern Longyear's range and in some can Canadian provinces as well. There's a national team of federal, state, and uh, tribal and other experts working hard to better understand the disease and trying to address it. But right now, we don't know of any way to halt it. So we led the effort. Hey, where'd my mic go? This is a, is this a trick? OK. <laughs> Um, the service has led an effort um, to develop a national plan for assisting states and federal agencies and tribes to manage white nose and bats. And we also led the effort to develop an implementation plan for white nose. And as part of that, we have um, reco a recovery team that's been developed. It's comprised of those states, tribal and federal entities, and other conservation organizations and scientific institutions. The service has granted more than $17 million for white nose research, for response, for investigations, um, to, to determine the cause of the disease and how to prevent it from continuing to spread. There are some individual habitat conservation plans that are underway for wind development, for forest management, and so forth. And uh, the northern long-eared bat is, in some of them, it's already a covered species, meaning they're looking really hard at ways to minimize impacts to that species as well as the other species that they're um, describing in the habitat conservation plan. The Minnesota DNR has been actively involved with us and engaging in discussions to help figure out ways to move forward. And we believe that the conservation efforts will benefit northern long-eared um, once they're implemented. There's ongoing research in the areas of forest management, bat migration, population trends. It's providing scientific information to inform the understanding of bats generally, and northern long-eared specifically, and white nose. Uh, the Fish and Wildlife Service, uh, we need to know this stuff as much as you do in terms of how conservation measures can be applied to really minimize harm to the species across the landscape. Okay. So
So I'll move on to talking a little bit about where we're going from here. We've reached out to the public, as I've mentioned, the state natural resource agencies, forestry associations, federal agencies, tribes, etc. We're developing scientific analyses and plans to inform our listing and provide a path forward to conserve the species. We've asked the public, as I've mentioned, we have that 100,000 comments from the two public comment periods. Our decision has to be based on the best available information, scientific and commercial data. We do expect having a third comment period. Not sure if Rich mentioned that when he was talking about the letter that the Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies is going to be submitting, but we are expecting to have that comment period around the middle of November after we've officially received that position paper or letter from the AFWA um, agencies and allow the public an opportunity to comment on the data that the states have provided to help inform that listing decision. So we would expect that to be mid to end of November. And as I mentioned earlier, April. then authorize take that might be associated with those conservation practices. The last way that the Fish and Wildlife Service can exempt take is through the Section 7 process, and that is a process that is a federal agency type of a process. So again, you know, it would be like the Corps of Engineers needs to issue a permit, and we would do a Section 7 analysis of the effects of issuing that permit, and any take for endangered species could be exempted via that Section 7 process but it's only for federal agencies. So, the next steps. Additional coordination, receiving the letter from the states, finishing up our analysis, and then, as I mentioned a little bit ago, the final agency decision, which is made by the director of the Fish and Wildlife Service. We need to keep thinking about conservation needs, considerations, 
and we need to keep talking and listening. And I've appreciated, I know I've only been here for a couple of hours, but I've appreciated hearing some of the conversation that's been going on. Does that mean I'm done? That ding? Oh, okay. <laughs> Just kidding. Anyway, I've appreciated hearing some of the, cons the conversation because 